Hi, everyone. I am so excited to uh, get the opportunity to introduce this session to you. Um, I uh, am, am feel so proud and excited that my dear friend and uh, colleague in education, Jen Saravallo, uh, is here for this session where she'll be talking about whole book assessment and instruction. Um, Jen is a teacher's teacher. Uh, she's one of those people that uh, is not only in classrooms all over uh, the country all the time, um, but she is listening and talking with kids and educators um, and parents and, and really thinking and feeling the things that all of us think and feel in our own classrooms. Um, Jen is widely regarded for not just her brilliance in the way she um, helps all of us and kids access high levels of thinking and engagement in literacy, um, but people also love how incredibly practical she is. Um, any session, any conversation with Jen, you not only feel instantly smarter, um, but you also leave with things you can do right away. I wanted to say on Monday, but it feels like you can actually do them the very next second, like you can walk out and start doing it too. Um, Jen is author of, of many books and, and incredible assessments. Um, one is from Scholastic, her independent reading assessment um, that uh, supports students in uh, not just having a running record that takes a small little section of a text, um, but really at looking at students as they read across entire books, um, and that's for both fiction and nonfiction. Um, her assessment has been used by a number of schools that I work with. Um, uh, myself and has really helped educators see uh, not just how well kids can decode on a page, but really how their thinking grows and changes across the text. So I'm looking forward to that, um, some of that coming up in this session too. Um, Jen's also author of two books at the same time. Jen, you have to unmute yourself for a second because I don't know how you do this. Um, Jen is so prolific in her work that um, she's the author of, of two books that just came out from Heinemann back to back, um, Literacy Teacher's Playbook. This one is for three to six. She has another for K to two um, that helps you look at all of the assessments um, that are available to you and not just treat them as digits and data and little numbers, but really look at whole children and make big decisions about them. Um, and I'm sure some of, some of that work from the Literacy Teacher's Playbook um, will be coming into our session here. Um, I also just want to plug, over my shoulder here is um, a new collection of essays um, bound in this beautiful book from Scholastic called Open a World of Possible. Uh, if you Google that title, you can find the entire book for free online through Scholastic. Um, and Jen has uh, written one of the essays in that book um, and, and several others uh, have as well. Um, and, and so it's it's a way that, that educators are, are inviting the world um, to, to think more about how reading has affected our lives and, and to, to just hold up the importance of reading in all of our lives. Um, so I am uh, absolutely uh, honored and excited to invite Jen. Oh, before I forget, um, while you're tweeting during the session, I'll be here on the side pulling tweets in. Um, if you tweet, uh, Jen is happy to bring some of your questions and comments into this session. So make sure that you tweet using her handle, which she'll point out and it'll come up on the screen in a moment here. And also, and I'm double checking checking the number, even though I just told you nine. OK. Also make sure that you are tweeting using the hashtag, hashtag the Ed Collab Gathering, and then add to that number nine. And then I'll be able to see the tweets here on this page, and I'll bring some of them up as well as Jen goes. Um, so without uh, further ado, because you're here for her, not me, um, I'd like to welcome my friend and uh, Ed colleague, Jen Saravallo. Um, hi, Jen. Hi, Chris. We are all here for you too. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for hosting this wonderful bonanza of PD on a Saturday. And as he as Chris um, um, was was plugging this, he kept calling it PD in your pajamas. So although I'm all business up top, I want you to know I am wearing pajamas <laughs> on the bottom in honor of this wonderful Saturday of learning from your home. So that should, that should be the new hashtag. Hashtag. We'll, we'll use pajamas. Hashtag I'm in my PJs, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, everybody. So as, as Chris said, um, on the bottom of the screen, you should see my, my Twitter handle. It's at jsaravallo. 
two R's, two L's. And um, when you're tweeting with the EdCollab um, hashtag, your tweets will come into a sidebar that only I can see. Um, and then if you tweet directly at me at places where I can pause for a moment, I'll check my Twitter feed and I would be happy to respond to um, any questions or comments there. Um, anyone who has been in a workshop with me in person or even uh, through my webinars through Heinemann or, or have hired me to do private webinars, you know that I like to keep you active. So this is a very new format for me to be mostly talking the whole time. So I do um, not just encourage you to tweet at me, but please, I beg you, please tweet at me so I don't so feel so alone. I have my dog with me on the floor, so I have some company, but it would be great to hear your thoughts and your comments as we go. All right, so with that, let's get started. I'm going to share um, a PowerPoint slide presentation, and that means that my face will go away. But don't worry, I'm still here, and I'll come back once in a while to smile at you. All right, here we go. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about whole book assessment and, and instruction, and this is something that matters a lot to me. I've spent a couple of years of my life researching um, what's the difference between when kids read whole books and when they read short texts, and why does it matter in terms of how we're looking at their comprehension, their understanding, and how does it impact the instruction that we have. And today I'm really excited to share with you um, some tips and tricks um, that you can, like Chris said, implement right away in your class room. Again, for the millionth time, this is my handle, and I'm going to be asking you to join in the conversation as we go. So um, while my face is not on the screen, you won't see that, but it's at Jay Saravalo. So let's start with this question, why whole book? Maybe some of you saw the um, title for this presentation today and you thought, whole book comprehension, what's different about that? Um, I think that one of the things that um, I think about most when I think about whole book comprehension is that folders and then you go back and put the folder back and then you get the, you know, try to get to the next one and it was always kind of like a race to get to the next color um, unless you're in that kind of a situation which I, I don't think too many people are nowadays I hope not too many people are um, your kids are probably reading whole books and so I think that um, when we're trying to get kids reading independently we're trying to hold them accountable to doing good work in those books we're trying to figure out ways to talk to them about their reading to confer with them it's really important then that we're thinking about what's different about whole book comprehension so reason number one why whole book matters is that independent reading, um, if you look at independent reading, it's probably mostly whole book. And even if you don't do independent reading, I'm going to try to convince you to because there's tons and tons of research that shows that independent reading really does make a difference for kids. Anderson, Wilson, and Fielding's research in 1988 is probably um, one of the most cited examples. If you read anything by Richard Allington or I'm sure Donalyn Miller um, probably quoted this this morning, um, the, the time that students spend in independent reading is the best predictor of reading achievement. So if you want your kids to do well on any kind of test, let them read. Um, that has been shown to do more for kids than actually giving them tons and tons of um, test preparation or skill and drill or anything else. So I, I do think, I, I'm not 100% sure about their research, but it's probably the case that they were looking at kids reading, independently reading books. Um, Crash and Cunningham, Stanovich, Allington, Presley, Taylor, a whole bunch of other researchers um, have found that students who read independently become better readers, they score higher on achievement tests in all subject areas, and they have a greater content knowledge than those who do not. So again, I, I'm concerned in places where I see independent reading being pushed to the side um, in the name of working on uh, discrete skills or test preparation or things filling in bubbles and multiple choice. It's really that the, the independent reading that we're getting kids to do um, should be, in my opinion, at the core of, of the instruction. So with that, um, you know, it's also that you can't just have some independent reading. You've got to also have lots of it. Um, Malcolm Gladwell convinced many of us in his awesome book, The Outliers, that um, anytime you want to get good at something, largely it's about the practice that we do. He talked about the, the 10,000 hour rule. And so in a lot of the classrooms where I work, um, 
as a as a coach, as a as a consultant um, in my own classroom when I was a classroom teacher, um, I really dedicated a lot of time to reading. And if there was something that came up, if there was a fire drill or someone had to run to the nurse or there was an interruption outside, it was really not the independent reading that would that would be sacrificed. It was probably some of my whole class teaching and really making time for that practice every day in school and of course encouraging kids to at home as well, although we can't always assume that kids are reading a lot at home even if we tell them to. Um, that is one of the things that makes the biggest difference for kids and it's so crucial then that we make sure that we set that time, time aside. Reason number two, if you happen to care about standards, whether it's the Common Core State Standards or whatever your state's version of college and career readiness standards are, um, I think that you know when you look at the the standards, um, some people are taking the standards and interpreting the standards to say. Um, that um, you know, we should be reading only close reading these very tiny little chunks of text. And sure, that's an important thing to do. Um, you know, Kate um, Roberts and Chris Lehman have really shown us how we can do that well. But it's also crucial that kids are reading whole books. In fact, if you look at the Appendix B in the Common Core Standards, that's the appendix where they list recommended um, exemplars, the, the kinds of text that they want, you might notice from this list that these books are real books. They are whole texts. They're not saying to excerpt three paragraphs from chapter four. They're giving you examples of the kind of literature and in the informational section, the kinds of information texts that are worth spending time with for kids. So again, whole books. So the standards are telling us to read whole books. The research is telling us to read whole books. And we know as teachers of grades three and up that comprehension really makes a big difference, that comprehension really matters. Um, and I think it matters to look at exactly how is comprehension different when it comes to whole books and short texts. So these are a few of the things that I think are kind of game changers as we move to whole books instead of short text. So one is the question of text accumulation. I'm not sure if anyone else uses this term besides me, but text accumulation. How much um, in a short text versus a 200-page novel does the child need to carry forward? So we probably have all had this experience where we're reading, um, we're reading a novel, and um, we we notice there's something that happens early on in the novel in the first or second chapter, and then as we keep reading later on in the text, something else happens that harkens back to that earlier chapter. Or maybe as savvy readers, we know something's gonna, there's gonna be something important about this early event later on in the text. I'm sure of it because I know authors don't just throw things in there for no reason, and so it it requires a certain level of memory and it requires a certain level of um, synthesis of putting things together to understand how what happened in chapter one is, is, is connected in some way to what happens later. Um, stamina. So some of you may have heard uh, Marianne Wolf, who's a, a researcher out of Tufts University, is working on a book right now that's been getting a lot of press. I haven't, I don't, I haven't actually seen that you can order the book itself yet, but the, um, the press that I've seen about it um, uh, the summaries of, of her of her ideas anyway are that she realized herself she's a, a self-professed lover of literature and, and novels and she found herself having difficulty reading these longer texts and she said that there's this kind of digital brain thing that's happening to us that you know our attention span is shorter um, we are used to if you're even just looking right now I don't know if you could see what I see but I'm seeing um, tweets coming up on my screen, I've got a sidebar, I've got like, like this is kind of how we live now, we're expected to be able to take in, I've got my phone next to me, we're expected to be able to take in these bits of information from various points and the, the, the brain work that it takes to stick with a novel or to stick with a long informational text and be in it the whole time and not get distracted to put all the information together, um, that's a skill. It's kind of takes some brain training. Um, so I already mentioned synthesis, but you know, just in an example of a novel, um, think about cause and effect and how as you get into harder and harder texts, the causes are not always directly before the effect and you have to be able to kind of infer to figure out the connection between them uh, or, uh, or how much a character will change across the course of an entire novel. Again, it's, it's something that you can't see um, on a one-page short story or an excerpt of a longer text. You don't see the same kind of character development and change, the same kind of collection of events that are leading to other events.
And then I think if we want to think about interpretation, um, when we're coming up with, you know, what's the story really about? I think so many children are accustomed to looking at a short, a short section of the text, and just from that short section, saying, "Here's a lesson." You know, you know, in this one little scene, the character um, does this or that, and therefore he learns this lesson. But really, interpretation of whole books requires that you can put all of the information together, or in a in a nonfiction text, that you can put all the facts together and say, "What is this mostly about?" and not drop information that's important and not um, overinflate the importance of other information. Okay, so from a comprehension perspective, looking at whole books and looking at short texts is also really different. So here's a, the first place I invite you to kind of tweet at me. I'm going to take a peek at my sidebar to see what kinds of tweets have been coming in. I'm just wondering, how do you know if your students are really getting it when it comes to their whole book reading? And how are you, do you think, teaching them to really get it? It, in other words, do you think you have um, a real handle on the, when the assessment of whole book comprehension, the assessment of change across a book, the assessment of um, how will a child be able to accumulate the event? How do you track your kid's stamina to make sure that they really are getting the whole of it? And I wonder, too, if you were to think about the, the strategies that you teach, the, the lesson ideas that you teach, do you feel like the way that you're teaching um, is, a, is, is aware of or, or honors the fact that kids are really reading um, whole entire books. So I'm just going to take a peek at my, um, my Twitter um, feed to see. It looks like people are tweeting some, some key, key topics from what I just mentioned, which is awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Lori and Leah and Mary, Donalyn, Susan. Thanks for tweeting. So if anyone has a question or thought about this so far, I don't think so, but I'm gonna again. I'm gonna keep checking my Twitter feed, and you can keep feel feel free to um, respond to my my prompts and also to ask me questions. So if I've convinced you, if I've convinced you that whole book comprehension is something worth thinking about, what's a teacher to do? So here's the here's the practical part of my presentation. What exactly am I going to do to um, acknowledge and honor the fact that kids are reading whole books independently? How can I help them to do it better? So this, this three-part cycle is something that's not uh, completely original, right? The idea that we assess kids. Um, we assess, and I think assess not, doesn't mean necessarily like test or grade kids, but rather um, assess, like look at them carefully, sit next to them, try to understand what's happening. And, and we, from our assessment, then we need to do some evaluation. We need to do some st stop back, step back and interpret what we see. Um, draw some conclusions from what we see and, and ask ourselves, what's the most important thing then that we can help students with it, it, when it comes to whole book reading? Um, how, how is this child currently making sense of the reading and what can I do to help this child make more sense of it? And then the next um, step there is to teach, to actually allow our assessments to inform our instruction. That's such a that's such an educational buzzword, but I think that um, it's something that it's a, it's often a disconnected cycle. We, we I think we're asked a lot of us are asked to do all kinds of assessments for numbers and letters and scores and spreadsheets, but it's not always the case that we look at those assessments and say, so what, right? So what am I going to do differently now because I know this information? How is my teaching going to change? How are my expectations of the learner going to change? Um, what exactly am I going to do? So I'm going to show you um, a way that you could assess whole book comprehension in a way that's manageable and fits into the fabric of your regular independent reading and how to take a look at what the kids um, write um, or how they respond to your assessment and to make some evaluations of exactly what should I do now. And from that evaluate, evaluation hopefully you'll determine a specific goal that you can work on and then you'll move forward to then teach. I'm going to show you in the teach section of my presentation how some strategies are aligned to specific levels of complexity or to specific goals that students might, um, might have as a result of your assessment. Okay, and so then, next. And yes, then a, a bunch of tweets coming in from people. It seems like uh, overwhelmingly they're saying conferring is, is the big way in their classrooms that they try to get to know the, the needs of their kids. Um, Allison, Jesse, Jesse saying tracking post-its as well. Yeah, those are those are great comments, and I, I do think conferring is so crucial to be spending time um, talking to kids. And I don't know if this is true for a lot of you, but I find when I'm working with teachers, one of the questions I get asked the most is, "How do I confer with a reader 
when I haven't read the book, especially for teachers like, you know, in a fifth grade classroom, say, where the kids are reading these thick novels and they say, well, you know, it's, I feel comfortable, I feel confident when I have, have actually read it, but when it comes to uh, a book where I've never read it before, it's 300 pages, I find myself sometimes um, floundering. And often what I say to people is that um, I, I have some tricks, I have some tricks up my sleeve to try to help me uh, make sure that I'm really um, attending to what the child's saying and understanding it. And one of the things I do is that I make sure that I have a good sense of what are the expectations based on different types of books or levels of books. I find levels very helpful um, because as, as, as the levels get higher, there are often new story elements or a, a different twist or complexity on the story element that comes into play. And if I go into a conference and I know um, that I, I know kind of what level, you know, UVW books tend to be and I know that the, you know, that the, the author is going to craft a very complex theme, that there's often multiple ways to interpret the title, that the characters are very well drawn and developed, that the secondary characters have major impact on the main character. If I can get a sense for the kinds of things I need to be aware of, and even if I haven't read the book, I actually feel pretty comfortable. I actually, I was in, um, I was at a conference and I heard Penny Kittle talking about conferring with, um, readers and books that, that she's never read before. And her, her work is largely with, I think, middle school, high school. So kids are reading these big books, right? And she said that she feels like she's even better at conferring when she hasn't read the book. Um, and she didn't go into elaborating on what exactly she uses to help her find her way. But I think it's a, a general knowledge of children's literature. I think it's good to read a bunch of books, to read and know a bunch of authors and a bunch of genres. And it's also, I think, I find it helpful to have a kind of a framework of different levels of text and how new um, complexities come to play in those different levels. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to help you feel a little bit more sure-footed in that regard as well. So let's go ahead and start looking at getting to know what whole book comprehension might look like in fiction at different levels of complexity. So I'm going to share with you four different strands um, that I think about. They're, they're going to be familiar to you. They're like story elements, right? It's four different areas of fictional reading. And the different skills that you may be aware of, like synthesis and interpretation and inference, retelling, they're tucked into these four strands. So these four strands are kind of like my, my mental organizing scheme for understanding fiction. I'm going to be using these three books, Days with Frog and Toad, um, Amber Brown is Not a Crayon, and Because of Winn-Dixie. I picked these because I thought a lot of people would probably know what these books are. All of these um, uh, books are available for a kind of a look inside on Amazon, so you could take a look more closely at each of them and get a sense of what the page layout looks like, the density of the text on the page. Um, for now, I'm going to be kind of talking about examples from those books. So my first of the four strands is plot and setting. And in terms of plot and setting, I'm interested in understanding how kids retell um, important events put together the problems and solutions, the causes and effects, and visualizing the setting. And it changes as the text gets harder. So in a book like Frog and Toad, where the story is really problem-solution focused, I could retell beginning, middle, end, and have a really good retelling. I could say, um, uh, Toad is trying to fly a kite. He tries and tries, and doesn't work at first, and by the end, he can fly the kite. Right, it's really simple. Problem solution causes come right before the effects. Settings are familiar and they're in illustrated for the reader. But I move ahead into a book like Amber Brown is Not a Crayon and things get a bit more tricky. Here, I've got a story stretched across 60 pages instead of just small episodic chapters like in Frog and Toad. And the problems here are both external and internal. So this is very typical of books at like level N and higher where the characters' wants and needs and um, problems tend to drive the story. Um, that now Amber's got this problem where she is, um, you know, her best friend Justin's moving away, but also we learn about how she's dealing with this in terms of her emotional changes across the story. And by the end of the story, it's not like it's a solution, like everything's fixed. Justin does move away. It's more like a resolution where she comes to terms with it. And then when things happen later in the story, there's that, that need for memory that I talked about earlier, where the reader has to think back to chapter one or chapter two and how those, those, how those things um, get carried forward. Settings are still familiar typically at this level. However, um, what tends to happen is that the, um, 
um, the illustrator no longer illustrates the setting, and the setting changes from chapter to chapter. So in order to check, track the plot, the reader also needs to be understanding changes in setting. Now when you get to a book like um, because of Winn-Dixie, now we're starting to see um, even more complexity where over the course of the book we may encounter flashbacks or flash forwards. Um, we may encounter plots and subplots. Right? So now the, now the reader is not just tracking a linear plot but multiple events and understanding how all those events fit together. The second strand is character. So if we think about Frog and Toad again, here we've got pretty simplistic characters who tend to be mostly one way. Um, we want to infer about them, interpret them, analyze them. Really probably what we're coming up with is one trait. They tend to be consistent from, from book to book, from chapter to chapter. And if they change at all, it's mostly change in feelings. Right? He's down in the dumps in the beginning of the, of, the, of the story because his house isn't clean, and by the end he cleans his house and now he's happy. But as we move into a book like Amber Brown, we see much more change in feeling across the story. Um, the characters are more well drawn. Um, so the author comes out and tells you that Amber it has um, these traits that are very helpful to her and also these traits that kind of stand in her way. Um, they tell her, for example, that she's a good friend to Justin and, and that she's good at some subjects and she's not as good as other subjects in school, that she's kind of messy. We see a jealous side of her when she realizes her friend is moving away. Um, and secondary characters, like her mom, start to become important and kind of impact who she is as a person. And then by the time we get to a book like Because of Winn-Dixie, now we're starting to see secondary characters who are increasingly important, who are themselves well-drawn and sometimes even key to themes and ideas, like Gloria Dump, who gives India Opal some very important advice. We see major change in the character across the course of the story. Vocabulary and figurative language gets harder as the text gets harder because there's more of it, for one, and the context a reader needs to use also gets greater. So from Frog and Toad, we see that often if there's a tricky word, there's a picture right there on the page to help you, or the author has kindly uh, defined it for us right there. But as you get into higher levels, um, like when uh, in Amber Brown, when she calls her the, her the boys in her class obnoxious, there's no picture on the page to help you. It's not really clear from the sentence. You have to really read that whole page to understand what the word obnoxious means. And then in a book like Because of Winn-Dixie, we start to see even more language being used figuratively, a higher incidence of challenging vocabulary, and there again the context might get even greater. Like that scene in the library with Miss Fernie Block when she's flashing back and talking about the creation of the litmus lozenges. And the, and the kids in the library all, all taste one of the lozenges and they say that they can taste sorrow. Right, that's a very unusual use of the word sorrow and the concept of tasting something that's not actually a flavor. Um, you really need to read that whole, that whole chapter, that whole scene to understand what it means. So larger context, higher incidence of challenging vocabulary and figurative language. Now we have themes and ideas as the fourth and final strand. So at the lower levels, um, naming a simple lesson um, is about good enough, right? We can kind of read a story and say, you know, this is about how even though um, people are friends, sometimes they need to be alone, or how even though people are different, they can still be friends. As we move into higher levels, we might start to see some social issues that inform the theme, like in Amber Brown, how her parents are divorced. We might start to see some symbolism like by Because of Winn-Dixie, where we see the, um, the tree in the backyard of Gloria Dump's house hanging with bottles, which of course literally are the bottles that she, um, where she had, had al drank alcohol, she had a pr drinking problem, but also sort of represents symbolically the mistakes that she's made in her life. Um, themes also get more complex and multifaceted, right, so we can't just say that um, that, that because of Winn-Dixie is about one thing, it's about different things based, based on the reader, of course, and it's also based on, you can interpret it through diff, looking at through the perspective of different characters in the story or looking at different, um, different plots that are happening across the story. So all of these things I think are important to bring to mind when you're looking at your students' comprehension, when you're assessing their comprehension, and also it's important to bring to mind when um, when you're teaching them, when you're conferring with them, you know, do you have a sense of how complex should the theme be? So when I ask a child, so what's the story really about? Are you holding up your knowledge of um, that level's complexity along with what your, what your student um, has just told you?
Really quickly, I'm not going to take as much time, but nonfiction, these are the four strands I think about. I'm going to use um, Seed Soil Sun, Look What Came From Mexico, and the Hindenburg Disaster as examples. These are all, um, just to show you quickly visually, in case you're not familiar with the books, these are all screenshots from, um, again, the Amazon Look Inside, so you can take a look at these in more depth. Seed Soil Sun, which is about kind of where Frog and Toad is. This is what that would look like in the interior. A few, a few um, sentences, a few facts on each page with a lot of picture support. Um, look what came from Mexico, around the same level as Amber Brown. Here we have multiple sections about different subtopics. We have a lot more um, density of information on the page, many more facts. And then here I'm going to use the Hindenburg disaster, which is a, a, a level R. And you might notice here that instead of each chapter being just one page, each chapter might be five or seven pages. So there's a lot more information to collect within each section and then across the entire book as a whole. Here's a peek into one of the pages um, in the Hindenburg disaster. And again, all of these um, images I'm showing you really quickly right now, you could look at in more detail and read um, if by going to Amazon and, and their look inside feature. All right, so here are the four strands. So the first is main idea, and I think we want to look at main idea on a couple levels. First is, what's the main idea of the part, um, a chapter or a section, and then what's the main idea of the whole text? Um, in lower level texts, usually the entire book is about one simple topic or one simple idea that's clearly stated for you at the beginning. In higher level texts, you often need to infer the main idea, and the main idea is usually multifaceted or more complex. Key details are the details that support the main idea. At lower levels, there's not too many details and they almost all fit together with the main idea. But as you get into higher level text, you start to see things like sidebars or cool facts or things that kind of pop out on the page. And the reader then needs to sort through the information to be able to really match up the details with the main ideas. Vocabulary gets more challenging as you get into higher and higher level texts and also it becomes more important that you understand the terms in order to be considered you know, knowledgeable about the topic you're reading about. And text features um, with a real emphasis here not just on identifying the features but trying to um, really explain the meaning you can get from the feature in isolation and then putting that feature together with the rest of the text on the page. Um, and what happens is as the text gets higher and higher, usually the text features go from, as you saw in the example, from pictures, photographs or illustrations that really closely match the, the text all the way up to a, a much higher level text where the features tend to be um, more text-based, so there are things like uh, timelines, sidebars, um, so you actually have to read the feature and then you have to think, what is this telling me? Almost like its own main idea and details, and then you have to think, how does it fit together with the page? So again, higher, uh, a higher um, emphasis then on more synthesis, more putting of things together and sorting through what's most important. So let's talk about assessment and how uh, we might assess this. So many people use running records, and I, I don't mean to knock running records because they are good for some things. They're good, they're, they're essential if you want to understand your kid's print work or oral reading and accuracy rate. They're essential for when you're trying to understand their fluency. You have to have your kids read out loud, I think, to really get a good handle on the, the nuances of their fluency. But if you're looking at whole book comprehension, then running records don't assess comprehension deeply enough. You just simply can't. How can you, in 200 words, assess what's happening across 200 pages? Right? And I don't think that um, you know the the people who or Murray Clay who created running records ever intended for them to be used in eighth grade to figure out kids' reading levels. Um, or to really diagnose, even even putting putting kids matching kids to books aside, even if it's not about the level, um, what kind of information does it actually give you for you to actually be able to teach? So here's what I suggest instead, or in addition to running records, I suggest that once your kids hit chapter books somewhere around level K, that you begin asking them to read whole entire books that you're familiar with, and sticking in sticky notes along the way. So these sticky notes may have questions and prompts on them that align to the four strands that I just presented to you. I'm going to share with you some of the prompts and questions so you get an idea of the language. Um, the, the, the reader would then read up to the point of the sticky note, and then at the sticky note, it would be like that sticky note interrupts their reading, and then they would go over to some kind of response form where they'd record an answer. Then they would continue reading independently, they'd get to the next sticky note, and then they'd respond in writing. 
maybe across an entire novel, 10 times, 12 times, they would stop and respond. Um, I, I don't think this, I don't mean to propose this as, you know, no longer will kids be reading independent, independent books, you know, just out of the library with no sticky notes. I'm not saying that this should replace all independent reading. I'm saying once maybe every three months or so, just to get a sense of how is your child really understanding the book? How is the child really connecting the events and, and putting everything together? It's helpful to have um, an example of a book that you've read yourself and you've got some sense of what answers show strong comprehension. So here's some examples of um, you know, a closer look of what you might keep track of on the response form. I think it's really important to keep track of um, the log um, how what, what's the child's pacing because one of the things if you remember that I said that's crucial about whole book comprehension is that kids can actually have the stamina for it so sometimes what I see is I'll see kids at the beginning they have a really good rate they're reading like you know three quarters half page per minute or one page per minute they're kinda of trucking along there and then as you get toward the books end their reading slows down significantly or they have the kind of hit this they just kind of get tired of reading this longer text that's really important to know uh, to help you match kids to books they're gonna be really successful with um, and again, a log is not necessarily something you need to have the kids do all the time, but I think as, a, as an assessment to get a sense for their stamina and their pacing overall, it's a really helpful tool. Here's a close-up of what the um, response form itself might look like. Um, I would repeat the question that you're putting on the sticky notes, and then I would also put down um, some lines for them to, rec for them to respond. Um, and I also think it's important to ask some kind of a reflection at the end. I love asking kids if they thought the book was a good fit for them and why, and ask them a little bit about whether this book matched with their interests. Um, and that's because I think it's a really a really important job of a teacher is to be a matchmaker, to make, I think that's a, a Jim Trelease term, to help make the, the match between um, the books in your classroom and the readers in your classroom. Um, and, and I want to know, did you like this book? Or if you didn't like it, let me help you find something different. I want to see if they can articulate beyond their level what makes, what, what is it about them as a reader that would help me to find other books for them that, that are a good fit. And I also think it's important information about monitoring their comprehension. Um, do they think it's just right, but actually it was really, really hard? That's really good information for me to have as well. So really quickly, here's a couple of examples of uh, the questions I might ask. This is in the plot and setting strand. I might ask them to retell what happens in the chapter. I might ask them about a problem or um, to explain the events that led up to a certain event that happens later, um, why an event happened, which would happen to cause an effect, or to describe the setting to check and see if they can visualize. I look to see if in the character strand, if they can explain to me um, what kind of person a character is. I want, I'm looking for traits or um, some other kind of descriptive words. I ask about change or how one character affects another. In vocabulary and figurative language, I would indicate, I would, I would kind of find these um, instances of words and phrases that are really important and that you could figure out using context. Not all, not all uh, words and phrases that are tricky are also supported by context. But I'm looking to see can they use the context to figure out words or phrases that are meant to be taken um, more figuratively than literally. And then in terms of themes and ideas, I ask about lessons or whatever language your children know, messages, theme, um, what have they learned from reading the book. I might ask about specific issues such as race or class or gender and how that issue shows up in the book. Um, I might find an instance where there's something that's concrete that represents something abstract. So I might say, you know, what does this suitcase represent? What does the dragon represent? Um, I'm going to actually skip through. It, I'll have to do this for the next Ed Collab gathering. <laughs> I'll just do the nonfiction, but I'm watching the time, and I think we should get through the uh, assess, evaluate, teach cycle. Um, so then what I would do is give the children a, a choice if you can, not just one book at every level, but maybe a couple books at each level. Give the child a choice, let them read at their own pace, keep track of their reading, jot some responses so I can see what they're thinking about, and then I need to evaluate their responses. 
Um, so one of the things I did, I told you I spent years kind of researching this whole book comprehension idea, is I took all of these kids' responses to all these books. I, I chose books at every level from K up to W, sent them out to schools all across the country. Um, all of the response forms came back, and I spent two full summers with teachers sorting through these responses and creating rubrics. So the, um, what, I've, what I'm showing you on the screen here now is a summary of, that, of the rubrics and where there are certain shifts according to different um, aspects of plot and setting. So for example, you see um, in terms of retelling important events, um, I found in my research there's an important shift from K to O and then again at P in terms of problems and solutions, K and O, and then at Q. So these are the places where the, the rubric, the expectations for readers' responses, changes, and it's based on the um, connection to the actual text complexity. Here's an example of, the, of one of the rubrics. This is for plot and setting. Um, you see on the left-hand column the different questions um, for plot and setting. This is part of my independent reading assessment. So every book has pre-printed questions in it and rubrics that, that go with each of the questions. But you could, of course, make this your own, on your own as well with, with books that you know well that are in your classroom library. So there are um, a number of questions, in this case four, for plot and setting for, for fourth grade rats. And there are three levels of... Um, of responses. Exceptional, which I think shows solid, strong comprehension. Proficient, which is is good comprehension, but um, could potentially um, be a little bit stronger. And then approaching, which is um, you know needing a little bit more work to be able to really understand what's happening in the text. And then the fourth option would be incorrect, which is just a complete misunderstanding of what's happening in the text. So the idea here is that the teacher would take the child's responses, let's say to question number four, read the child's response, and then look at the rubric to say, kind of where does it fall? Does it feel like this child really gets it, kind of gets it, or doesn't really get it at all? Here's an example of character. So again, here there's three questions that go, um, that ask about character, main character, secondary character, and fourth grade rats. Here's the vocabulary and figurative language rubric and themes and ideas. So again, this is from my independent reading assessment, and there are two books at every level from K to W in fiction, and two books at every level from J to W in nonfiction. Let's just practice trying one of these together. So question number one says, what kind of person is Stuart? And the student responded, Stuart is a person who likes to worry about his stuff. He likes to worry about school. So if I look over um, on the exceptional side, it says um, the sample student response is he worries too much about going to third grade. He's grumpy but has a cheerful family. Proficient says Stuart worries a lot. Approaching says he doesn't like his clothes or he's going to be a third grader. So I might say here what well, this one feels closest to, answer in your mind, feels closest to proficient, and then I would circle proficient on the response form. I would then tabulate or keep track of how many um, um, for each question where the student's response fell in what category. And then I could clearly see here for Nadia, if you look in the plot and setting column, down where it says EPAI, she got three incorrect. Whereas in the character, vocabulary, and theme columns, um, she actually answered in exceptional and proficient on the rubric. So this is showing me that she actually um, is pretty solid when it comes to inferring about character themes and vocabulary, but in terms of plot and setting, she needs a little bit more support. So then that could become her goal. This could become the goal that we focus our instruction on. When I'm conferring with her, I could teach her ways, strategies to help her um, with her, with her, um, with her retelling. And so part of the independent reading assessment is um, uh, there's hundreds of strategies of how to actually turn this assessment information into, um, into instruction. So I'm going to share a couple with you now. And keep in mind that I think that strategies need to match the level of complexity and take into account whole book comprehension. So for example, if I were to give a student the strategy for plot using first, next, and then, uh, readers must carry along and recall all the important events in the story. One way to do this is to tell the story across your fingers using the words first, next, then, after that, finally. I might say to myself, who is this best for? More like a frog and toad reader? More like an amber brown reader? More like a because of Winn-Dixie reader? And I might say, well, probably more like frog and toad, because I know at that level the text is very linear. Um, one event clearly follows to the next. 
or this one. I'm going to consider secondary char characters as catalysts and consider the secondary characters and the qualities that they have and how they help them learn lessons. Well, I know that secondary characters um, start becoming really big kind of in around the because of Winn-Dixie area. They become a little bit important in, in um, Amber Brown, but even more important after that. So I really want to make sure that I'm teaching this not to someone reading Frog and Toad. Right, so those are just a couple of examples of, um, of ways that I think it's helpful to think about your instruction matching what your students are actually learning and um, that we have in mind when we're conferring with, with readers that we're matching the instruction to the level of text complexity and we're matching our instruction to the goals that they have that are based on an assessment of what we're asking them to do every day, that are, asking, that are based on an assessment of um, how well they're actually handling that whole book comprehension. So I hope I've given you some good tips of things to be thinking about and maybe inspired some of you to try to make your own or if you'd like to check out the independent reading assessment, I have some free downloads on my website under the odds and ends tab. Um, you can get a sense for the rubrics and the expectations and, um, and give that a try. So once again, I thank you all for joining me and I thank Chris so much for putting this together today. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. And Jen, can you say your website again because there are a couple of people saying, where, where, where? Oh, sure. Um, so it's jenniferceravalo.com. I'll put it here. So it's just my name. Did that show up? I would turn it off and turn it on. There, there it is. Go. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> so it's jenniferceravalo.com. And thanks, Jen, uh, for, for sharing this with us. I mean, I, I know for me, when in my own classroom with an even, uh, you know, consulting as well, there's all there's countless moments where you're seeing kids with books in their hands and you're just asking yourself what's really going on in there. You know, like we kind of have this like hope and dream that just because it's open, it's really important work that's happening in their heads. Um, so I, I'm so grateful for you for sharing this way that we can really open up they're thinking for us so we know what to do next. So thank thanks, you very Chris. much. Thank My pleasure. You. And thanks everyone for joining us. Enjoy. Um, there's two more sessions left. Um, session four is coming up in 15 minutes. Uh, and then uh, I'll be giving a, a closing at three. Uh, so thank you all for joining. It's been so, so awesome watching all of you on Twitter and reading your tweets. Um, so hope you're enjoying your day. Enjoy the last couple of sessions. And thanks for being here.